Welcome to Melinda Livesey 2049, you guys. Let's do a quick recap. Melinda, what is going on? Well, ever since our talk a few weeks ago, uh, where I started off thinking I needed one thing, but completely changed the entire conversation. Well, you completely changed the co entire conversation um, in a good way and had me think about my three-year goal and what I really would want to do with my time, not just working to then stash up money so that I could actually do what I wanted, but what was the thing I actually want to do and to start doing that. Okay, so you haven't done so before. Please watch that video right now. It's going to give this conversation a lot of context, and I think it's important. And I also, I'm a little surprised. I want to be honest with you, because sometimes I have conversations with people and I say things that I think, yeah, they should do this, but almost always, like 90% of the time, they resist, they resist, and they resist. So let's see if Melinda is going to resist. I think you came into that conversation with a very specific idea, and then you heard this other crazy thought. And can you take me through what was going on emotionally, like inside of you, before we dive in? Well, at first, which it's really good for me to be in that situation because then I realize what clients think mm -hmm. when I also pivot the conversation. Um, I first felt very frustrated that you wouldn't just answer my initial question. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my gosh, Chris okay, does fair. it again. Here he goes. He doesn't like, listen. Oh, nah, embrace nah, nah, and nah, pivot. Nah, nah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> so, because it. sometimes it's like you just want an answer to your question. Do you really? But, well, I do at times. Mm -hmm. But in the end, after the entire conversation and we talked through what what I truly want and you got down to the the root of my question and why I even asked that, um, then I left more empowered and excited, but it did take the entire conversation for me to get there. Okay, so you went into a, maybe looking for an answer, a quick fix. You, you were a little frustrated, like, why won't you just answer it? And I think I know where this is going, and here he goes, and then you do it, and then you leave. Maybe with some clarity? Yes. Maybe not with the full plan. The blueprint isn't there just yet, but at least now you have clarity and that's one of the most important things that you can do for any client is to help them figure out what is it that we are, what we want to do and what's worth doing. Okay. So I think that's a good recap. Now let's dive in. How do we begin this conversation? Well, now that I'm focusing on, well, I'm pivoting mm -hmm. again, because last year I pivoted from just design to strategy or adding strategy. And now I want to keep strategy. It's like I'm holding on to one thing and going to the next, you mm -hmm. know, from one mm -hmm. branch to another. So I do want to keep strategy and consulting. Let design start, you know, fading away. And then focusing my attention on creating content. So writing, sharing more in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so now where I'm... I don't want to say completely stuck, but what I'm thinking through is how do I, who do I talk to and what voice do I talk in and what, you know, we say know your ideal client so yes. that you can speak to them. I have clients as far as branding and then I have brand strategists and designers that also follow me. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, who am I even talking to when I do create this content? So we're talking about this evolution of yours, and I think for a lot of people, that can be very daunting because you feel like, hey, I'm finally making some progress, and now we have to change again. And I think one of the things that I want to point out is I think as human beings, we desire to make progress in our life. Think about it. One of the most frustrating places that you can ever be is the DMV because you get a number, and the number seems to take forever to move forward. And it feels like there are 100 people ahead of you, so you're going to be here for some time. You're making very little progress. Conversely, if you feel like you're always taking a step forward and when you look behind your shoulder and you can see like the old you kind of disappearing in the distance, that's one of the pillars of happiness is progress. So I think that's why a lot of creatives are excited about doing new things. But what they do when they do new things is they kind of stay in the same vertical and then they kind of move to the side a little bit. But now we're going to be a lot more strategic about adding a new thing that's going to take you to the very next level. So we're not just going to be moving laterally. We're going to be ascending in our path towards ultimately unlocking who it is that we need to be in this lifetime. Okay, so having said that, let's dive in. So you're talking about who are you talking to? That was your question, right? Yes. Who am I talking to? Who do you imagine this person to be? I've been observing myself in what gets me in the creative flow mm -hmm. as far as when when I'm writing or when I'm sharing content that it just 
there's no effort really involved. Ooh. It's just sitting down and just doing it and it it works great and then people really like it. I've noticed that it's me talking to other brand strategists or designers. It's like me talking to myself six months ago. So it's it's someone that I can relate to, um, someone that I know their struggles and what they're thinking or what they're feeling because I've been there. So it's like a previous version of me. How many versions ago was that? Not even that long, probably my last transition. So my transition from designer to strategist. That was your first big jump though, right? Yeah. Okay. Besides going from um, in-house designer to freelance, that, yes, that was my last biggest jump. And in terms of chronological time, we're just, are we talking about six months, a year, a year and a half, two years? Uh, how much time are we talking about? About a year to a year and a half ago. So 12 to 18 months ago, something happened to you. You started to see something and then you wanted to move forward and that happened to be becoming a strategist. Okay, so now you want to speak to the older version of you because I think there are a lot of people out there that are wondering the same thing and how do we know? And because they comment in the videos all the time like, wait, how did how did Melinda get there? And And I think maybe we can take a half a second and talk about how you got there. Just high level, like here are three or four things that you did to kind of acquire this knowledge. So for brand strategy, mm -hmm. I went through the core kit that is on the future. I learned that, I joined the pro group, and I worked through the core kit with other people in the pro group. So we got on calls with each other. We also did strategy. So core teaches strategy, that's what it is. It's a strategy framework. Mm -hmm. So we used core on each other to learn it. Um, and then from there, I did some free strategy uh, workshops yep. with clients, previous clients, and then I started charging for it. And each time I doubled how much I charged. Awesome. I want to quickly point out something that you did, which is something that I asked people to do and you did it perfectly. You had clients that didn't see you as the new you. They just saw you as the person that was previously in front of them, which was an excellent designer, a person who gave great customer service, and that's why they were talking to you. So it was a printing company and you told them, look, I don't do this anymore. This is what I do. This is a new thing that I do, and I'm willing to do it for you for free. And they're like, mm -hmm. eh, I don't know. This sounds kind of weird, right? It wasn't instant like, oh, we're in love with the new you, Melinda. And so there's a little resistance. And people are reluctant to change and accept change from themselves and from others around them. That's just human nature. It makes us feel uncomfortable. And so you did this for them. And they're like, okay, that was cool. And here's the remarkable thing. They recommended a bunch of other people to work with you in this new capacity. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so that's kind of what you have to do, you guys. You have to first know what it is that you're looking for in order to get it, to attain it. So I think for whatever reason, a bunch of different things were percolating up in Melinda's world that she was thinking, I wonder if there's more to this. Is there something else that I can do that's even at a higher level so that I can do better work for my clients, work that is meaningful and has an impact on their business? You sought out that knowledge, you acquired that knowledge, and then you applied it quickly. This is the key. So she was able to go out and practice within a safe space and grow more confident and feel like she could do this and you could see the results. The wonderful thing is when you take yourself out of the equation and you actually try to help somebody else, you get a new feeling that I think a lot of designers still haven't experienced yet. When you genuinely help someone else achieve their goals versus achieving your goals. Now, a lot of you guys would be watching this video and think, no, 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 everything I do is in service of the client. Well, let me ask you this. What typefaces did you pick? What kind of design decisions did you make? Where did you lead them? And most likely, you led them exactly down where you'd like to be, what's most comfortable for you. So if you don't do web design, for example, and you hear a problem and they need a web design, you kind of tell them, no, you need a new logo. And if you like clean, simple, and modern logos, there's a good chance you're going to tell them you need a clean, simple, modern logo. See, so there's a lot of bias that we bring, and that's okay. First thing is we just need to acknowledge that. So Melinda goes in and she helps somebody in a very genuine way, and she gives them a gift. Didn't cost them anything, and the results surprised them so much so that they're willing to share what they got, and that's how Melinda started to onboard new clients. So that's a big jump. So what kind of product or template or article can you write that you think you can help the old you make that transition? Uh, 
in an easier way. I feel like there's a lot that can come out of that. I, I have written some on even my messaging process that came out of knowing strategy. Mm -hmm. And so there's, I think there's a lot that can be taken out of that and bits and pieces, not just one you know blog post, but it could there could be a ton. It could be going into each uh, workshop that I did and specifically give examples of what insights came out of it, how they came out of it, or go into deeper uh, sections like messaging, like identity, and how strategy influenced it. Mm -hmm. um, and give specific examples. So I, I know that I could do that. The question that comes up is, it's, for some reason I have this, there's tension between, well, I, I have that idea of those who can't do teach and yes, I've done it and I've, I've been successful at it, but I think in the back of my head, I'm still thinking, well, I need to reach certain milestones before who am I to be saying these things? So Is it's like this conversation, I guess so. Okay. Um, but then I, but then the other half of me goes, well, you did it. And it's just sharing your process and what you did. It's not like I'm sitting up there saying, you know, I'm awesome and I've accomplished all of these things and you m must listen to me. It's more just, hey, this is what I did. This is what worked. Maybe this is what didn't. Um, so those are the conversations that I have in my, with myself about it. The question I guess would be, I'm still then talking to brand strategists and designers will that help me in getting those brand strategy and consulting clients? Because you know how I, I said I still wanted to do that, I still wanted to do brand strategy, I still wanted to do consulting. So how will this also help feed that? Okay. So in order for people to recognize what it is that we do and what we want to do, we have to first let people know this is what I do. So if you have a thought in your mind, you have to be able to translate that thought into some kind of action, right? So how will people know that Melinda is a good coach for aspiring creatives and also for clients who want to do brand strategy in the way that she talks about. How do you think they're going to find out about this? By me sharing and then people talking about it. We know if we keep it a secret, we know that we just put it on our website, hey, this is what I do, I did da 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 The real problem is unless you're getting a lot of traffic organically to your site, you'll be the best kept secret in the world, right? Right. So this is what... I think, is it Ryan Robinson? He talks about this. He talks about content marketing. And that's a term that a lot of people misunderstand. They think content marketing is to create things like to pitch and to sell your services, uh, like a different version of an ad. And I don't think it's like that at all. So if you think of your ideal customer, someone who's in need of brand strategy, who's probably rebranding most likely or launching a new brand. So people that are launching new brands, it seems like the most fertile space for that is startups in the tech sector, but that can be kind of tricky. But somebody has a need. They have a compelling event. They feel like they've outgrown their old brand. Or perhaps they've done something and they've always been a little shameful of the thing that they did. Like somebody's cousin put it together and they needed it and it worked. It got them out of the gate. Well, whenever they handed their business card over to somebody, they always felt like, oh, that doesn't really represent me. And then they go on their site and like, yeah, but our site's not really reflective of who we are. So we hear these kinds of things. So this person out there, this whoever's in charge of this, has a compelling event. They recognize the need to change and update or take their brand in a whole new direction. Now, how are they going to find you? So content marketing is about you creating a resource, almost like your best advice to somebody for free and put it out there. The goal is that if somebody's searching for a very particular phrase on Google, that they're gonna see your thing pop up in the top 10 organic search results. So now begins the work, like what will you make? Now, now here's the thing. So if you just put brand strategy for XYZ on your site, it might pop up on Google, but chances are if it's a popular search term, there's a lot better content out there and Google learns what people want. So if they land on your, on your homepage or landing page, they're not going to see a lot of value there. They're going to see just another person pitching and talking about that. But if they go to this, what Russell Brunson calls the pre-frame, on a page where it's really like content rich, it could be a short to medium length article where you might, I don't even know how many words, but like say 10,000 words, and you really break down the process and the way that you do it and the benefits to the customer, and you give them some valuable tools on what they can do internally, 
there's a good chance now you're going to really move high up in the rankings, right? Right. Here's my question. That okay. sounds like it should be then in the voice of talking to the client, not the brand strategist. Okay, you are the brand strategist, right? I am, but like we had mentioned in the first part that who am I talking to when I when I share this content and I and I write best and I can share the most when I'm talking to previous Melinda. So previous oh, Melinda is a brand saying. strategist. So then when you're talking about that, then there's oh, two different. Okay, okay. Right? There's the client, then there's the designer. So oh, I get it. So we're wondering if the content that's going to appeal to the old you, the designer's making the transition, let's call them the transitionary transitional designer right career cha- not a career changer but they're like leveling up yeah and then there's the end client who might hire you to do this so here's the really cool part that we found and and this is anecdotal data here is that we put out a lot of content to help creatives not to, for owners per se or client clients but just for creatives and then it turns out that a lot of creatives watch and consume our content and then it's brought up to the decision makers so most likely they're going to be your champions like, wow, the way that Melinda does this is really interesting. Should we bring her in? Should we consider bringing her in to help us? So this is the in-house designer helping to bring you to the decision maker. Because chances are, if we're being realistic, unless you're really amazing at writing articles and you're out on TED, the people who are making decisions have very little time to find you. But the people who have more time most likely are the creatives in your past. And yeah, that makes yeah. They that can makes push more you up, sense. right? And that's what's happening with yeah. us, because right now, oddly enough, if you ask me like four years ago when we started this as the school and now the future, would large corporations be calling us up to consult for them and their creative teams? I would say no, because I don't even know who's watching this content. But that, in fact, is exactly what's happening right now. Large companies are calling us and saying, "We have a team." We have a team of 30 creatives. We need your help in teaching them how to pitch or how to focus on the bigger business goals or how to negotiate with clients. These kinds of conversations are starting to happen, but they didn't happen over and I just want to warn you about that. Right. That was my next question is Mm -hmm. how, how long, how long and then what percentage would you say would be the, the teaching portion? Like you're talking to designers and then what portion would you say is coming from clients like that? Or have you, have you landed any of those jobs yet through the future? We have. Okay. I think. So what, what percentage would you say if like, it was like even gross revenue percentage? There's no, no way for me to accurately track this. So I'm just going to have to give you my gut feeling. We, we don't have any more sales reps. We don't have any more executive producers in-house or out-of-house. Anybody selling for us at all. Zero. So the only two ways that work comes to us now is through previous clients and referrals and content marketing from the future. So I'm going to say that pretty much the content marketing is going to eclipse the referrals and the existing clients pretty soon. So I, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but for example, we closed a $130,000 job from a client who are fans of ours first. And these calls are happening all the time. And we're doing brand sponsor deals that are worth um, probably over half a million dollars because we're popping up on people's radars. That's what's happening right now. So I, I guess, I don't know if we talked about this before, but and I don't even know if this is true, but do you know like a, a bamboo seed it takes like three years for it to grow? And you can plant and water. It just takes a really long time for you to see any results. And I think content marketing is like that. That this is not a quick fix, an instant solution. This is take care of the seed. Keep watering it. Keep nurturing it. Look after it. And when it sprouts, I think a bamboo tree can grow like a foot in one day. Which is ridiculous if you think about it. And I think that's what's happening. So you build up enough momentum. You build up an audience. And then all the parts and pieces click. If you think about somebody in the marketing space who is an influencer, who do you think of? What name comes to mind? Russell Brunson. Russell Brunson. Maybe Seth Godin. Yeah, Seth Godin. So Seth has written 18 or 19 books now. Russell's written a couple, and he's pretty prolific at putting information out there. If you think about negotiations, who do you think about in terms of influencers? Brian Tracy and Chris Voss. Yeah, Chris Voss. Um, Never split the difference, right? Yeah. And Brian Tracy's written a ton of books, too. So these are people who have planted these seeds, and now they can decide what they want to do with them. Mm. So a lot of people in this space say, in order for you to become an influencer... You must write. The first step of making anything is to write your thoughts down. So you could share in 
kind of informal blog posts that you write on a daily basis, or you can try to sit there and really spend a month or a month and a half writing a really great piece of content that's well-researched. The cool part of this, too, is you don't have to do this by yourself. There are a bunch of writers out there who are very good at saying, taking your idea and filling in all the gaps and finding all the stories that you don't have time to research. So there's, as you're talking, it's, mm-hmm. it's interesting to hear because you're essentially taking care of and getting known in the industry that you work in. So you are giving information to others. So it's that, uh, what, community over competition. So instead of competing against everyone else, you're pretty much giving away everything for free. So then everyone in the design community, they are getting value from you. And then they also, they're, they admire you and they're for you. So if they aren't able to take on something, the first person they're probably going to think of is you and your team, I would think. But it's an interesting thing because it's switching from being competitive with everyone in the design community and instead forming more of a community, and you're still benefiting from that. Yeah. I've not heard it phrased that way before, community over competition, and mostly because I don't feel like I have competition. Maybe I'd have, I used to feel this way many, many years ago where I felt like there was a, a finite number of jobs, the zero-sum game, and there's only so many jobs to go around. So if somebody wins, then I lose. And if I win, somebody else loses. And it creates this really unhealthy mindset. And then I had to help our team understand when we lose a job, it's not because they beat us. It's because we lost ourselves. And we need to constantly figure out what we're doing right and what we could be doing better so that we can uh, continue to grow and make progress, right? Because that's a big theme in my life, make progress every single day. So I'm not necessarily thinking, let me build a community, but as you talk about it, it makes perfect sense that if you give out your knowledge for free, you automatically rise above the competition, quote unquote, because it's like, well, Chris is not competing with you anymore because he's just going to give it away. So he must be better than you or he must not even care anymore or something like that. Yeah, there's something that there's when something someone there, right? gives away mm-hmm. something of value without any strings attached... I also think that speaks to a level of confidence as well. Yes. Because those who are not confident in what they're doing, they're not going to share what they do. Or they want to hoard it and they're like, oh, no, because they're in that competitive scarcity mindset. And they're like, I'm not going to share it because I don't want everyone to know. And then they're going to use it and beat me and I'm not going to make any money. So it does show a level of confidence. So then potential clients also see that as well. Or creatives who end up referring you to their... Yeah, so here's the funny thing that's happened in this path that I've been on, this journey, is that when we give this information away for free, former competitors would call me and ask me for advice, no longer fearing that I'm out there to take away from them or they're going to reveal some secrets to me. One of the really remarkable things is I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, people who are leading in their own industry space, and they won't tell other people the kinds of things they tell me which is kind of strange. It's like, because I've been so forthcoming and so open and transparent. One of the first things I do is I tell people what we grossed the first year, what we grossed this month, last year, whatever they want to know. And then all of a sudden, I think it disrupts their pattern of thinking. It totally disrupts it because they're not used to people in the creative space sharing this kind of information. And in doing so, they desire to reciprocate. So when I ask them a question, there may be some apprehension or suspicion at the very beginning but then they just tell me. And that's pretty cool because I can't really help you unless you tell me. Mm -hmm. And so I I think you're right. When you share openly in a very transparent way without a hard sales pitch anywhere in there, I think you demonstrate confidence and you demonstrate expertise. Those are probably two very desirable traits for anybody looking for a collaborator or a vendor or partner to work with. Yeah, exactly. And I've seen that happen too. I mean, maybe not to the volume that you have yet, but mm-hmm. I have even seen it this past year as I've put out even the minimal content that I have, but that still has built the trust and people looking at me as the expert. So I do see that. And I see you appearing on lots of different podcasts, blog posts, interviews, those kinds of things. So this is all happening to ultimately help you build a fabric or a network to lift you up above everybody else. Because at the end of the day, people hire who they know. And in order for them to hire you, Melinda, they have to know you first. 
and you're making it a lot easier for people to find you right now. Now, is there more that you can do? For sure. But you're doing a lot more than I, I would say 90% of the people out there who's watching this right now. I want to just tell you a little side phenomenon right now. So people keep messaging me now saying, how do I get to be <laughs> the next Melinda? You created a platform to shine the spotlight on somebody and then you coach them and then they get the free advice. It looks like you're sidestepping your whole consulting business. And I say, well, maybe I'm looking for a very special somebody. And when I meet them, I know because they have an interesting story. They're a good person. They already have mastery over, I would consider, the design fundamentals. Now they just need a little tweak because I'm really lazy. I want to do the minimum amount of effort to get the greatest amount of reward, not just within my own business, but with the people that I coach. So I look for very coachable people, right? And you're able to articulate your thoughts. And I think you have a very small ego, and I think that's a good thing. Like you're, you're ready to listen to me, but if you hear something funny, you'll challenge me and then you'll process it and you're very logical in the way you process things. So if you guys want to be the next Melinda, you have to be Melinda. You have to have all these traits. It's not just because, hey, I need help or I want to be in the spotlight. It takes a special somebody. Well, thank you, Chris. You're welcome. <laughs> so let me recap what I heard and what I'm going to do. So I came in wondering who I should be talking to and what kind of content or when I create content, who am I creating it for? So then we went into, I'm creating it for previous Melinda who transitioned from designer to brand strategist, incorporating that into her process and sharing the brand strategy process and what I do, maybe insights from clients, um, workshops, or I, there's so many topics that I can go into with that and, and how I transitioned and serving the design community and getting known and continuing the path that I'm already on as far as podcasting and interviews and whatnot to serve the design community. And as I do that, that will naturally position me as an expert who's confident that she can do strategy for clients, for designers, or companies that designers work for, or creatives. Now, I think you already knew that coming into this, I think. I suspect you already knew this. So we're looking for some confirmation. Now, there are two schools of, two schools of thought on this, okay? There's our mutual friend, Bonnie Sang, who's done a very wonderful job of building a community, and she's hyper-focused on building the right kind of audience. And I think her philosophy is that, if I may be so bold to speak on her behalf from her last post that I read, which was, it doesn't really matter the number of engagements that you get. It's the quality of engagement. I love that philosophy. So that's a very viable approach. So she's hyper-targeted, hyper-focused on creating the kind of conversations with the right people that she wants to attract. And I'm on the other side, which is kind of more of a mass. I cast a really wide net. I'm trying to help as many people because our missions are very different. My mission is to teach the world. And the world doesn't sound like five clients to me. The world sounds like however many billion people people on planet earth who can benefit from our content so we have very different approaches there's probably many more there could be a hybrid of the two where you can do a blend of a super hyper focused thing knowing that at the end of the day you got to pay some bills but then you also want to help a lot of people and build a broader audience that's up to you is that okay to say yeah i would i would say that and i would think that i would be a somewhat blend of the two of you probably because i still I, I see what Bonnie's doing as far as attracting a certain type of client. And I think also because both me and her are more in the lifestyle space as far as the type of work we do and the type of clients that we attract, that I am pulling a lot of, uh, you know, learnings from her and what I'm doing. But then the other side as far as what I'm sharing, what I'm teaching and who I'm serving would be more on your, your end. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of mixing and, and that's why too, I think it's really important for myself and other, you know, designers to find people like Chris, like Bonnie, people that they can look up to, that they can learn from, because everyone does have a different way of going about this and studying what it is that each of them do. Cause I think we can kind of, you know, take from each person and make it our own or learn what we're attracted to or what works best for us. Yeah, you know, I was recently at a very high-end grocery store and they have, of course, a beautiful salad bar with all kinds of vegetables, cooked, uncooked, and protein. 
And that's that's the thing about life is you don't have to eat all of it all at the same time or eat only one thing. You can actually pick parts a la carte, whatever your base is and whatever else you want to add and whatever kind of dressing or no dressing. That's the beauty of life. So if you meet a, a teacher and the teacher I'm going to use in, in the very broadest term, not one who has a degree in teaching or does that professionally, but someone that you can learn from. It could be literally from a book or a video that you watch. And there may be parts of it that don't really apply to you. You get to pick the parts that you want to apply and try. And the more you feel like that person resonates with you or their teachings resonate with you, the more likely is you're going to fill up that plate really quickly and just add lots of things. And that's totally okay. So you can cherry pick, right? So all my the way I see my job and my responsibility here is to communicate and articulate my thoughts as clearly as possible. And sometimes I have to say things in a very bombastic or, or an emphatic way so that you're clear. I don't want to be Mr. Grayscale. I, I want it to be like, this is what I'm saying. Pick the parts that make sense to you. Okay, so of course I think you're, you're a smart woman. You're going to pick some kind of hybrid version and probably morph it into something that fits right for you. It's a tailored suit made just for you by you. A suit of ideas, right? Right. So I do have one other question that is, now now that we know who I'm talking to, now I want to know if this even matters too, is does it matter that I'm working under a business name versus myself? Because as I'm talking, as I'm sharing more about my process, I'm thinking, well, that makes more sense to then represent myself under my own name, not necessarily my business name. Mm. But does that even matter? I think that's a very common question and something that people ask all the time, whether you're starting up or you're thinking about switching, what name should you adopt? And I think the name that you have is the best name moving forward. Unless you're getting lots of complaints about how does how do you spell it or it has some negative connotations uh, in a different country that you weren't aware of originally, I would just say stick with your name because that's all it is. And what I would say is I would just write on, on behalf of the company, just as you. So it becomes a very personal brand. Aaron Draplin has DDC, and he just goes by that, right? The Draplin Design Company. And it doesn't mean anything to anybody. It's just the DDC, and that's what he's got. And he likes that, and he's working with it, and that's totally fine. And I think with Marks & Maker, you really, Marks & Maker's just you. Whereas we, we have the opposite problem, which is we're the future, and a lot of people associate the future as just with me, but actually there's a whole team of people, different writers and and an ever-growing team of content producers. So I'm doing my best to make sure that people don't so tightly associate my name and face with the future. Because for us to grow and for us to thrive, it must do that. Just like with Linda.com. Even the name Linda.com and her logo had her face on it, Linda Wyman. But obviously, the courses were not all taught by her. Actually, a very small percentage were. So it's just a brand, and you get to shape that brand and the voice the way that you want. And I think now you can feel more empowered or emboldened to just write on behalf of yourself and share your thoughts so that it doesn't feel so corporate. Yeah, I agree. Okay? Yeah. So I hope that answered yeah. that question. That does, yeah. Okay, super. I try to be on my best behavior today to answer your questions in the most succinct way because at some point we do need to get tactical. I can't just keep scrambling your brain up the whole time, right? Having said yes, that, I'm about to- please don't. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> having said that- Shoot, I thought I'm I got out of it. I'm going to scramble your brain okay. right now. Okay, let's scramble it up. I think where we left off last week was me encouraging you to kind of go ahead and pay the bills to build more client work, but why don't you do the work that's going to make your soul, your heart sing with joy? And I think that's you creating products around design and whatever idiosyncratic observations you have in life, coming up with a strategy, coming up with a design, and writing the voice for the thing. And we like to do lots of different projects, so I think this is tailor-made for you and what you want to do. Why not begin to build that business model? I thought the conversation today was going to be about, okay, I'm ready to go down that path, Chris. I'm going to leave this other world behind. I'm going to move forward with this other thing. But we weren't quite ready to go there just yet. We're still holding on to how do I get more work as a brand strategist, right? Well, yes, because that is part of my three-year plan, though. It's not solely, I don't, at least from my vision at the moment, it's not to completely leave it behind because I still very much enjoy it and that I, it does make my heart sing to do that. 
And so I do still want to do consulting and brand strategy and get more of those clients. So here's I a quick think... test for you. What? This is a test for you. Ready? Oh, no. No, no, no. Yes, no, 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 yes. no don't, be, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Here's a test for you. I'm going to become uh, a billionaire. And I just set aside money to help creatives just like you. And I say, how much money do you need to survive? Right? And you're like, you know what? $150,000 would be fine. And then I ask you, fine, here's your money. Now do whatever it is you want in your life. Whatever makes you happy. What are you going to be doing with your life, Melinda? I still would do what I mentioned last time. <coughs> Excuse me. I know you don't Something want me to answer throat. that, but <laughs> at the moment, I still... Then you I have not tasted have it. I think that's the problem. You have not tasted it yet. That's true. I, I And maybe I haven't yet. Right? So when you're lying in bed at night and your phone buzzes and you check and three thousand dollars worth of orders came through and you're sitting there and you look up at the ceiling thinking about how did I get here how is it that I'm making three thousand dollars while I lie in my bed I've done no work today once you taste that it's going to be very difficult for you to go back it's like the first time you have have this delicious dish have you well, yeah. tell me. Let's talk I mean, about not that. Not three thousand dollars worth. Right, right. But... Tell, tell me about it. What did you do? So I have an e-course that I created What's it two called? years ago. Mm-hmm. Freelance. Freelance. Okay. So it's for those who are very, very new to working for themselves or mm-hmm. freelancing or getting clients. Okay. Um, so I made it two years ago, and I at for the past year, it's been set it and forget it. So I have done maybe. 10 minutes of accounting every month. Okay. And still How much money sold. have you made? Total? Or, or in a just month? monthly? In a month. Um, it's averaging 1200 to 1500 a month. That's respectable. That's good side money for only putting 10 minutes worth of work. Now, I'm going to change something here. Okay. What if you added a zero to that number? Okay, just imagine that first. Yes. Now instead of making twelve hundred, which you cannot live in LA on that, let's say on the low end you make twelve thousand. So that I think is one hundred forty-four thousand dollars a year. That's the first part. And let's imagine every single day, somebody somewhere in the internet writes to you to say how much you've helped them. So you're getting all this kind of gratitude from people. And you're getting gratitude in terms of dollars to kind of keep your lifestyle going forward. Is that something that you would possibly spend more time on or to think about, wow, that's pretty cool. What else can I do to help other kinds of people? Maybe I can replicate that product across a different industry, maybe for florists or bakers or whatever it is. So like, wow, we have a plan for it. I'm going to empower people to live their life fulfilled uh, doing the things that they love. I I would still say, and maybe it is that I haven't completely tasted it yet, but I would still say, yes, I would put more time into it, obviously, yes, but I don't, I still don't think I would completely give up the one-on-one consulting. Yeah. But I do believe the percentages would change as far as where I'm devoting my time, but because there's still gratitude in that, there's, and there's still... I also thrive off of making those connections one-on-one with a person and having those right. those types of interactions and connections. So I think the percentages would change, but I don't know if I can yet say that I would leave it all that behind. Okay. Uh, and, and this may be the most controversial thing that I'm going to say today on this episode. Here it comes. I suspect, Melinda, and I suspect, I suspect that you desire to do creative work for other people because this is how you're trained to think. That seeing somebody else's face light up with joy, doing the things that you do and the things that you're good at gives you also immense joy. But I think this is a script that was handed to us by our society, our culture, where we grew up by our parents to do this. Because the idea of going out and just making your art is seen as frivolous, as inconsequential. And I'm just telling you the story from my own point of view. For many, many years, people used to ask me, are graphic designers artists as well? Because like, this is my art. And I'm like, no, this is not my art. I was paid to do this. I'm solving somebody's problem. It isn't just about this pure expression of who I am or what I see in the world, right? So for many, many years, probably for two decades, I've told people, 
designers, in my opinion, are, are not artists. We do something for other people and that's it. And we get paid for it. It's very specific, right? And then I see artists as the people who have an idea, an emotion, and they want to see if they can capture it in some form and get somebody else to feel the same thing. So when you look at a Jackson Pollock and you feel what Jackson Pollock feels, then it's a pretty successful piece of art. When you watch a film and you cry where you're supposed to cry and you feel uplifted in the moment where you're supposed to, then I think that director is the artist who's shaping those feelings for you to say, I wanted you to feel this. Where am I going with this? For the first time in my life, as I'm creating these videos for you and for our audience, dare I say it? I'm an artist. I'm an artist now, Melinda, and I make art. Art for the masses, and they get to tell me they like it or they don't like it. And how do I know? The view counts, the comments, the thumbs up, the negative comments, whatever it is, it's an immediate feedback. And now I look at the work for our clients as rewarding but trivial in comparison in terms of like what makes me feel really happy. And for everybody that's listening to this who's watching this, I don't care if you're 12, you're 22, or you're 92. I wish for once in your life, somewhere along that timeline, that you're able to do something for pure joy of self-expression and somebody is able to give you the value back in what you put out into the world. That could just mean for some people a thank you letter, a cake that they bake you, $100,000 or whatever it is. I wish for you all to experience this in your life and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to change that conversation that we have with ourselves about what it means to have a successful career and what is it that we do. Because I was watching this video and it has a really simple diagram. It says, I made a thing on one side, stick figure, right? On the other side, it's like, I want that thing. And in the last 20 years or so, there have been gatekeepers and barriers, cost of entry, people deciding who gets to make what and who gets to buy what. And now all that's gone and we bring those two things together. I made a thing, I want that thing. And I think that's a really beautiful thing that these social networks have eroded all the barriers between an artist and a consumer. And the consumer can be the artist and the relationships are interchangeable now. That's what I'm thinking today. I'm standing at the tip of a boat going off what I think most people might consider the edge of the horizon where the boat's going to fall off the edge. And I'm trying to yell back, yo, you guys, over here, there is no edge. The edge is infinite. You can just keep going. And everybody's like, no, we're really content where we're at right now, Chris. That's for you. That's all I want to share with you, Melinda, what you decide to do with this. That's entirely up to you. Did I that make sense? Go yes, it, it did. And it raises more questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, that's fair. okay. We all become artists. We all do our thing. It, that does sound great. I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, disagreeing with you. It does. I think I need to taste it more. Yes, you do. To experience that. So not disagreeing with you on that. I am wondering now if we all become that artist, we all start doing what we want to do. And it does serve the greater good. Who's going to do the services? What services are we talking about? There are people that will possibly still be in need of the services that we left behind to go do our art. Well, let me ask you this question. Why is it so important that you know how everything else is done? Why does that matter to you to answer that question? Well, because if we're talking about the greater good, about helping all these people that... It's just a, a curiosity that I have. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what we're talking about is being at the tip of the spear and you're all, you're going back to the shaft of the spear to the butt end where the feathers are tied or whatever it is. And you're like, hey, they what still about need the help. butt? They still need help, right? Yeah, they do. But, but I think you can be at the tip of the spear and lead the way and create room for other people to say, wow, okay. I can get in on this. Now, okay. let's talk about this. Of the people watching this video... What percentage of the population do you think that is? It's a tiny, tiny little fraction. It's a point zero 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 zero. you know, how many zeros in there? 1%. And other people who are watching this video, how many people will hear this message and resonate and actually take action? And other people who take action, who will play it for the long haul? Who will be in it for the infinite game? Who will be here in 18 months saying, it didn't work month 17 and it didn't quit, but month 18, it worked, it clicked and it happened. So I'm not really concerned that all of a sudden everybody in the world is going to be rushing in here to do this. Because to be honest, 
they're not even watching. But to be truthful here, not many can. Now, I would not be looking at you right now, Melinda, and giving you this advice if I didn't think you could. Because I don't give the same advice to every single person I meet. Somebody starting out in their career, I would say, you know, you got to work on the fundamentals. You got to learn how to design. You got to go make something. You got to be more passionate. You got to sacrifice some sleep time for time to hone your craft. So this is not a one message fits all. It appears that way because I'm speaking to a broad audience, but I'm speaking specifically to you right now, Melinda. That's the only person I'm talking to right now, that you can do this. And I want it for you, but like I, you know, you can't hire somebody to do your push-ups for you, and that's okay. And here's how I feel about this, is that at some point, I think we're going to make such a big difference in the world and make a lot of money doing it in pursuit of making a difference in the world that it will then become blindingly obvious to so many people. Now you're trying to get in on that train, and that train is packed with people. Right now, it's empty. That bullet train, there's like two passengers on it. You could be passenger three, or you can be passenger 3,000 or 30,000 because there's room for the, the people at the very front, the innovators, and then there's the early adopters. And then all the way at the back end of the butt of the train are the laggards. They're just like, oh, I guess everybody's doing it. I guess it's time for me to do it because I can't talk to you if I don't adopt that piece of technology or that idea. Where do you want to be on that train? The innovator. The who? The innovator? innovator <laughs> i think so <laughs> yeah i thought you said the intermitter i'm like who's the innovator? <laughs> that's a new term that i have not heard no. before beautiful Wrong. this is an oc term that i'm not aware of <laughs> okay you understand yeah yeah so yes. look i say this and people are like man he's, damn, he's there he goes again and he's gonna do this thing and it's really up to you i am i think a person who practices what he preaches i am training my son who's 12 years old to think this way, to break every pattern of thought that was handed to him that I don't think empowers him. Now, here's the really cool part. I was listening to Tony Robbins' um, broadcast on YouTube. I don't know how it is that it popped up on my feed. I guess YouTube knows a lot about me. I'm listening to it, and he says something that really is resonating with me because he's had a lot of practice saying this that he said in a way that I was like, darn it, I'm going to steal that. So here's what he said. Whatever you look for, you will find. Whatever you look for in life, you will find. So if you look for opportunity, guess what? Opportunity appears. If you look for ways things can go wrong, then you will find ways for things to go wrong. If you look at a person's like, I wonder what he's up to, can't trust them. Guess what? You're going to find things that you can't trust. So right now, all I'm asking you to do is to consider looking for something different and to start to question when something enters your mind, does it empower you or does it disempower you? And I just want you to think about that, all right? Because I think soon, and, and people predict these kinds of things all the time, I soon meaning in the next 20 to 30 years, that automation, artificial intelligence, all these kinds of things will do all the things that we now think are mundane tasks that are boring and repetitive because the human mind is meant to do so much more. So in that space, perhaps the robots will take care of all those jobs. I don't know. But I don't want to be around to wonder like, okay, now the robots are replacing me. And I'll give you one more example, okay? A few months ago, I was in the Philippines. And the Philippines is one of the largest call centers in the world. Like when you need tech support, customer service, there's a good chance that you're going to call into the Philippines. And they have massive areas, blocks, dedicated with giant buildings where Filipinos come in and they do this work, okay? And what's happening is they're all getting laid off. There's going to be such massive disruption in their workforce. I don't even know how their economy is going to survive this because they've created an entire culture to do work at the very end of that spear, work that can be easily replaced by robots. And it's already happening. So when you call up a customer service line, it's like, how can I help you? And it's like that slightly robot voice. And if you need service, just say service, or I can understand what you say. And it's a robot with an incredible script where it can kind of figure out the words and direct you down a funnel. And the better they get at voice recognition, the more jobs are going to be displaced. Because what we've done in those kinds of industries is we've built human computers to do the work of robots. Now, you're nowhere near the robot thing. But I was like, why do you worry about that? 
Why do you worry about what the masses are going to do? Uh, maybe it's just me procrastinating and not getting on to what I should be doing. Maybe. And let me ask you why. The emotion that you feel around the ideas that I'm sharing with you, does it make you angry? Does it make you scared? Does it make you frustrated? What's the emotion that you feel? Because then all of a sudden, it's manifesting itself in a different way, right? With, I wonder what they're going to do, Chris. I think it, I always go back to overwhelm. Like when something's new, when I have to pivot or when I have to learn something new, um, I mean, normally it's me being very excited about something. Yes. Um, but I do also feel overwhelmed at mm. times. Just so you with, have mixed emotions. Yeah. Like okay. I am excited about it. Yes. I definitely want to do it. Uh, but it is. It represents. Like, oh gosh, where do I start? Right, and, right. You know, it's the whole. So it represents to you work. It represents stepping into places that you're uncomfortable with because you don't know what the outcome is. Now we're very, and we should be, we, we're very careful and protective of our own time, right? It's like if I give up three hours of my life today, I want to know that there's a result. And here's the crazy part of doing new things. There is no guarantee. The only guarantee that I make for people is if you do what you do today, then the guarantee is you'll get what you've gotten. And that's pretty just straightforward. So here's the thing. So there's this part inside of you that's fighting it. It's like, oh, I, I feel like I want to do that. So I'm going to ask Linda a question right now. So a, a while ago, about 18 months ago, you were in a very similar position where you're on the one hand uh, an identity designer and then you're thinking, I want to be a brand strategist, but that's a lot of work. You're going to have to watch videos. You're going to, you're going to have to expose yourself and you're going to have to get into a group and you're going to have to practice and you're going to have to learn new things. Now, if you're looking at yourself now, kind of from the future, how can you advise yourself to just go for it? Well, at that point, I had enough information. I, I had a plan. I had something to learn, which was core and which was a strategy framework. So I had the next step in front of me, whereas I don't see the next step necessarily in front oh, of me now. I see. So I had, it. Okay. I had it. I was like, okay, I know what I'm going to do. So then once I jumped into it, I was like, oh, I can see the benefit of this. It was pretty oh, fast. Whereas okay. now I'm like, I got to first figure out the first step, which I believe is creating the content, which we already talked about earlier. So that would be step one. But I think I don't see enough after that. Okay. To get this is very about. interesting to me. Okay. So with core, there was a kit. It's been written. It's been edited. There's visuals and there's video component and templates and all that kind of stuff. So when you got it, you're like, ooh, it's a kit of parts. I can see something and somebody's worked on this. So unfortunately, when there's new things out on the horizon, there's not always a template, a, a framework, a manual for you to follow, right? right? So if I were able to give to you some kind of step-by-step -step process, an outline of what you need to do, would it feel like that's something that you can take on? And so some of the anxiety, the overwhelm that you feel, might dissipate? I think that would help. Yes. Okay. Definitely. If there's something that you can think of that would help you, like where you can say pretty definitively, that is what I need, Chris. You can say it to me right now. That seems like the best option. Okay. Short of like not knowing what the better option might be, which I don't know either, right? Well, that and because core was already set, we already saw so many testimonials out. It's like, okay, it's proven. It's good. Right, right. So you Whereas are a laggard. Is, you I'm are like, a laggard. I need some testimonials first. <laughs> You're a late adopter. You want so maybe much. Maybe it's true. That's yeah, true. maybe that's that's something that is just part of your DNA for right now. But I believe we can change all that kind of stuff, right? Now, here's one thing I want to say to you, okay? To you and everybody that's watching or listening to this, which is this, is that I want you to adopt a different mindset. Plans are overrated. I was just talking to Joey Caffone, Caffone uh, on Baron and Fig. He's like, yeah, forget the plan. We don't need a plan. I like direction and momentum in favor of a plan. So, or in lieu of a plan, forget that. Like, I want to just go in a direction and I just want to move because I know that things will come up and I'll have to change the course. So people want such a bulletproof plan that they make no misstep, that there isn't time to meander and discover and change things. Because I had to tell you something, in the four years in which we've been doing this, we've changed so many times that I think we've lost count. 
And that's scary for a lot of my team because like, Chris, uh, six months ago you said this and now we're here. It's like, yeah, because we keep evolving. But all you can see is that our audience is growing. The impact that we're having is growing or deepening and the revenue is growing. So I know like we're moving in the right direction. It's just sometimes the plan has to change because new things present themselves and I want to be able to react. And I throw the plan out the door. Right. It's like uh, I think is it Mike Tyson? It's like everybody's got a plan when they step in the ring until they get punched in the face. You can't follow up that, that plan anymore because it doesn't work because you're getting clobbered out there. So I would like for you to start thinking about Melinda as a person who is going to let go of the plan, the whole mapped out life and the course and these steps and these hours get you these results to adopt momentum and direction. I like what I'm hearing. I want to move and I'm just going to take steps and I'm going to keep adjusting as as I go. And your new plan will be a framework for yourself on how to learn, how to adapt, how to make change, how to assess whether this is worth pursuing or not. Once you have that plan, no matter where you want to go in life, you will be able to achieve it. That's the plan that I have. Okay? So let's lay it out right now. You need to create content. The first thing I want to tell you is find the platform and the style that suits you the best. Ben likes to write and research. That's where he's the strongest. I like now to produce videos. I don't want to write. So I do things differently. So find the platform and the style that suits you the best. Once you identify that, all I want you to do is to try lots of pieces of content to make small bets, not one giant bet, just small bets. I have an idea to write seven articles. That sounds good. Rather than I have an idea to write one giant article. Just try. Write something and see what happens. Write something else. And be careful to read the feedback, to see the engagement that you're getting so that you can react to what's going on. So this is where the plan doesn't help you. It's like my only plan is to do something once every other day, every third day. I'm going to write something. And... I'm going to encourage you to be as open, transparent, and honest with what's going on because people want to go along the journey with you, not to be talked down to, but like I'm right next to you. And I think that's one of your biggest things is that your appeal is that people like relate to you. So as you make mistakes, you can say, I made a mistake today and here's what I learned. And just do that, right? Like yeah. you and I were talking and... I said, I want to have you more on the show. That was the original plan to begin with because I remember reading some old social media posts of mine. I'm like, hey, I want to welcome the new co-host. But it didn't really work out that way. It was more like a special appearance. And then the problem was it took up too much of your time. So I had to tell you it's probably worth both our times to come together to do this. And that was as much of a plan as we needed. That as we produce content, I'll be reading the comments that you guys write and then I will say, wow, they want more of that or they want less of this. Or maybe we should edit to be shorter pieces of content or whatever it is that they want. And then eventually, hopefully, we have a show that's going to get 100,000 views within a month. Versus us sitting down together six, seven, eight months ago and saying, well, what's the master plan, Chris? Well, here's episode one. Here's episode 15 and having it all worked out. Because in my opinion, when you're doing something new, something you haven't done before, you need to remain flexible to see what's going on and you need to adapt. That's the key. Okay, so the first rule after you figure out the style and the voice and where you want to go is just to make something and sit there and look at the feedback and keep working with that. And if it doesn't work, we'll talk again and we'll change the plan. Because you're like, hey, I did that and it sucked, right? No, like, I feel okay. good about it. I think that is, that is empowering. Here's, well, just thinking through how I'm processing this, that mm -hmm. coming in wanting a plan, I think I come in wanting that because, you know, plans, they're proven, other people have done it, whatever. But it is actually more empowering to, like you said, have the direction and just maybe have the first step to do and yep. enough momentum to just keep doing it, that that's actually more empowering than if you were to give me that checklist yeah and I want to tell you something about plans I want everybody to know this okay investing with Bernie Madoff was a plan that was proven until it was not proven uh, subprime mortgages were a great plan until that plan was proven so I think we put 
too much stock, too much security, too much confidence in so-called plans that work. I'm always suspicious of plans that work because after a while it's like, isn't everybody just doing the same plan? That's why we try to do things so differently with what we're doing. Because, yeah, everybody's running a webinar to sell courses. Like, well, why do I want to do that? And there's a very specific formula and template that you go down. And I just think, well, one person figured it out, but does that mean that's the only way to figure it out? And I don't believe in that. So those plans, like, I just want to do things and see, did that work? Measure? Do it again. Keep doing it. And perhaps... Along the way, you learn lots of things, first of all, but perhaps you invent a whole new way of doing things that is really suited for you. So I don't want you to put too much stock into plans, okay? Try something and let's see where it goes. Now, I would love for you to also incorporate more personal stories and photos so that your articles and whatever it is that you're going to do feels really reflective of Melinda as the brand and hopefully Melinda as the artist. Yeah. I lean into what people think of me. You know, they think sometimes I'm a little harsh, I'm very critical, um, and I am I have a very high degree of expectations when it comes to getting things done correctly. I'm hyper-efficient, right? That, that is truly not all of me. That's just the part that I show the internet, and our audience seems to like resonate with that for the ones that like it. So I just give up more of that. And I think people want something very special about you, and sometimes we have to look at them to see what they see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I see, yeah. like, look, look at the contrast between your screen and my screen. <laughs> right now, I've got the Blade Runner 2049 or Fahrenheit 451, the, <laughs> the orange teal look, right? In a darkened room that's totally controlled. You are in a kind of sunlit room. You you have natural hair and plants behind you, and you feel very earthy and grounded. And that's what people want from you, I think. I agree. And, you know, here's a really cool thing. When people want you for you, that's a good feeling. Yes. Versus, uh, can you make the logo bigger? Oh, that's not feminine enough. Oh, I think that's too corporate. After a while, you're like, really? Mm. That gets old, I'm telling you. It's like all those people who want to work on big name projects. They want to work on the Nikes of the world or Apple commercials. And I think once I do that, I will be fulfilled. And I said, we've done that. It's a dragon you're chasing and it doesn't exist. You do it and your life doesn't change ever. Because you're looking for an external thing to validate an internal need. Fix the internal part. You don't need any of that stuff anymore. Okay, I think we burned away a good hour. Do you have any final parting thoughts, Melinda? I think what we ended on in that direction, for people to know that that's how you stay at the end of the spear as the innovator. Because if the you're tip, looking the for tip. a plan... <laughs> the tip, <laughs> the tip, sorry. Not the but, end. That, but if you are looking for a plan, that that is way far down. That's not staying. Yes, if you want a proven thing, there's a playbook and a manual. That means so many other people have gone out, got on board with that and have done that, that at this point, you're kind of coming from behind. And I, I see you as an innovator, Melinda, and I see that's within you. And I want to encourage for you to let the beast out. And hopefully, if you guys are watching this, I would love for you to share your thoughts and comments on whether or not you like the blue and orange light. We're playing around with it. Of course, we can change this around and we'll continue to do this. Let us know what you think of that and continue to support Melinda. Give her encouraging thoughts or advice or opinion, but be uh, be encouraging, okay? And make those comments below. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And I'll see you guys on the next episode with Melinda.